Good evening, viewers. Welcome to my show, Health is Well. Today we are here uh, at the event which is held by uh, organization by the name of Unity in the Community. They have uh, arranged a uh, seminar here on the drug abuse. So we are here to record this uh, seminar. In this seminar, um, uh, there are different guest speakers coming, uh, like Steve Morrison coming from uh, Canadian Health uh, Mental Health Illness and Dr. Naveed Mohammed, he is coming from, uh, he is uh, Vice President uh, from William H Hospital, William Osler Hospital, and Dr. Uh, Raza, Said Said Raza, he is uh, a psychiatrist from uh, William Osler Hospital. So they are going to talk about uh, the uh, drug, one another psychiatrist is coming, his name is Dr. Raza. Uh, Said Raza, he's a psychiatrist at William Osler Hospital. So they are going to talk about drug abuse and uh, how the drug is affecting to a youth. So this program is actually for the uh, uh, awareness of the drug abuse and uh, how the drug is uh, killing our youth. So we are stressing upon uh, the parents also and the youth also to be aware with the, uh, how the drug is uh, uh, drug abuse is killing our youth and their mental health. So uh, this program is going to be uh, soon started. So I'm going to record this for the uh, my viewer on uh, health is wealth on NJTV Digital. Um, but when I sobered up and um, got into this field, I became really passionate about helping people with, uh, with substance use issues. In particular, lately I've, I've spent uh, the last year really researching uh, marijuana and, and uh, the impact of it, both what I see with the clients I've done this presentation a number of times in the community. So um, we're basically going to play a little game of fact or fiction about marijuana. Uh, we're going to just briefly talk about how marijuana works. I'm, I'm not a doctor, obviously, um, so I don't get into it in, in too much depth. I'll just, just briefly talk about it. Uh, we're also going to talk about, obviously, the, the impact of marijuana on mental health. Uh, most of that is, is from my own uh, observations that I see, uh, along with the research that I've, uh, that I've gone through myself in my uh, education. Uh, we're also going to talk about some of the different kinds of marijuana that are available now compared to what was available years ago. Um, and then if you've got any questions or anything, um, just to kind of put it out there, this is a very open presentation. If you've got a question, you can put your hand up. Obviously, this presentation is designed to be in a more uh, small, small group. I actually wasn't expecting this many people. So, um, but um, just you know, we'll try and keep it as interactive as possible. So, first of all, it's not some fact and fiction. Marijuana is a harmless drug. Who thinks that's fact? Completely harmless. Yeah. That's fiction. Marijuana doesn't present the, uh, the immediate dangers of drugs like heroin, cocaine, uh, even uh, crystal meth. Um, but, and, and in short term use, short term use in small doses, uh, it's unlikely to cause any harm. The problem is when you get into more, more heavy use, uh, long term use can lead to problems with physical, psychological and emotional health. And it can, from what, we've, what we're, we're seeing in the community, worsen existing mental health problems. How about smoking marijuana is just as harmful as tobacco? Who thinks that's fact? No way. Smoking marijuana, you gotta remember that I'm talking about smoking it. Yeah. Yeah, smoking marijuana, as the, the, the gentleman who was before me just, just pointed out, when you're smoking it, you're taking in the carcinogens that are in there, plus anything else that, that's in the paper that you're using. Um, that's when it becomes a problem. As the gentleman before was saying, um, if you're vaping it or eating it, then it's not a problem. But when you're actually smoking it, bringing in smoke into your lungs is a harmful thing to do, no matter how you do it. How about marijuana does not kill brain cells? Fiction? Fact! Marijuana doesn't kill your brain cells. However, it can cause changes in the brain structure, which again, the, the previous presenter was doing for me, uh, was talking about for me. Um, including lowering IQ if it's used at an adolescent uh, time. Um, heavy users of marijuana find that their short-term memory is poor, and most find that they've got a lack of energy and motivation, along with finding it difficult to learn new things. Marijuana always leads to harder drugs like heroin and cocaine. Who thinks that's fact? Nobody, good. Fiction. 
Marijuana has long been known as a gateway drug. Um, however, um, some research does suggest that marijuana is use, use is likely to, uh, to proceed going into other substances and the development of addiction in that area. However, um, the vast majority of marijuana users, users will never go on to any harder substances. I'm really flying through this presentation because it's meant to be a lot longer. Um, marijuana is addictive. Who thinks that's true? Yeah, absolutely. So while it doesn't cause the physical dependence to, to the other substances do, like alcohol, uh, cocaine, or heroin, um, it does create a psychological dependence to the escape from what's going on in the reality. Um, it's a, a common thing that I come across in my, my job, um, and a lot of my clientele come in for marijuana addiction, um, and they, uh, the major reason for using it is escaping from what's going on in their day-to-day in -day life. So I'm going to say something that's a little bit controversial to a lot of people, not to everybody, but to a lot of people. Drugs alone are not addictive. What I mean by that is, um, and I'm going to quickly go through this, it's much longer when I do it normally. Um, if every single drug that you take was addictive, every single person that takes it would become addicted to it. Every single person who drank alcohol would become addicted to it. Every single person who uses cocaine, and there are people who use cocaine recreationally, uh, would become addicted to it. Unfortunately, it's a combination of what we call a biological, a psychological, and a social impact that creates the addiction. Um, otherwise known as a biopsychosocial model, which I'm sure some of the doctors will be talking about later on. So how does marijuana work? The body, with all the beautiful thing about us becoming uh, legalizing marijuana recently, is there's been a lot more research into what it does to us and how it interacts with the body. And what we found is that um, the body has its own en endocannabinoid system that is responsible for things like sleep, well not responsible, but it's uh, involved in things like sleep, appetite, mood, motor function, pleasure and reward, and memory. Marijuana has two primary cannabinoids. Uh, that have been studied in recent years, when working together or on their own, they can produce some powerful results. THC is the primary one, which I think most people have probably heard of. Uh, THC is responsible for the high that people get when they smoke marijuana. Uh, it's been found to help some people with insomnia. Um, it can stimulate appetite in people that are, that are recovering from anorexia. It can assist with pain management and in high content, from the studies that, that, we've, that we've come across and my own observations, it can be responsible for something called a drug-induced psychosis. The other, the other cannabinoid that, uh, that's been highly researched recently is called CBD. Um, CBD is an interesting uh, component when it comes to, to marijuana. In high content, it can actually counteract the, the impact of THC. So if you're, you're smoking something with a, a THC and a CBD level that's on a one-to-one -one ratio, the individuals won't be getting as high as they would if the THC was here and the CBD was at a lower level. Um, this is really interesting in, in some of the research that's being done right now. Um, it's been found that it's uh, the short-term treatment for anxiety. Uh, research has suggested it assists with mood regulation. Um, and the big one for me is I was uh, recently introduced to a study that's, that's in process where they're looking at the impact of CBD as an antipsychotic. Um, I think that's uh, a really interesting research that we should be keeping our eyes on, um, in, particularly in the medical field. THC and, and CBD imitate the body's natural cannabinoids, effectively boosting a weak, weaker system, or in some cases replacing them, which can cause the individual to stop producing their own naturally. Now, the studies that are out there have shown that in low controlled doses, marijuana cannabinoids can have a number of significant benefits in multiple areas, including many physical and mental health conditions. High doses of THC, though, have been found to, uh, to be a significant factor in the onset of what we call a drug-induced psychosis, and studies suggest that the use of marijuana with high levels of THC for long periods of time can result in prolonged and permanent symptoms of schizophrenia, where there is a predisposition for such a mental illness. There is no evidence whatsoever that marijuana causes schizophrenia, where there has been no vulnerability to it or a predisposition. Now, how does marijuana affect people's mental health? The empirical evidence suggests that long-term use can continue to, uh, can, uh, can contribute to elevated symptoms of depression and anxiety, 
Withdrawal from long-term marijuana use including, includes anxiety, depression, irritation, mood swings, sleep problems, and a loss of appetite. While there is no evidence of physical dependence, research suggests that long-term use can result in, a, in psychological addiction, as I said before, to the escape from reality, avoiding the environmental, emotional, and psychological stresses. So marijuana now is a little bit different than it was a few years ago. Really important to understand this. Maybe 10 or 15 years ago, most of the marijuana that was available out there on the streets was probably sitting in at a THC level of around 8 to 9 percent, which is, you know, wasn't that strong. Maybe it mellowed people out, calmed them down, uh, you know, allowed people to still function somewhat. The stuff that's coming in off the streets right now and the things that are available um, from the medical marijuana field can be in the region of 25 to 30 percent, sometimes even higher than that, 35 to 40 percent. And if you're smoking some of the other stuff that's out there, so for example at the bottom, the different forms of cannabis that's available, chatter, for example, is a crystal form. Uh, they smoke it in rock, so it looks like they're smoking crack cocaine, um, can actually contain as high, as high THC levels as 80 to 90 percent. Uh, when you're in um, a, a significant factor when it comes to drug-induced psychosis, when you're smoking something with that amount of THC in, it's no wonder that we're seeing people showing up with, with drug-induced psychosis and only testing positive for THC. So what can make marijuana be, be a problem? Um, the primary thing to look at is a vulnerability to mental, mental illness such as schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. Um, because what can happen if this is lying dormant in the system because of a genetic issue, when people are exposed to such high THC levels um, and drug-induced psychosis, it can lead to those symptoms coming on and then not, uh, not being able to go away on their own, if you like. Uh, when I was using substances myself, I was, through marijuana, I was put into a number of psychosis, but I was fortunate enough to be able to come back from that. Um, I consider myself very, very lucky with that because obviously there is no predisposition for it. Um, Family or personal history of psychosis or psychotic symptoms is also a red flag. History of drug or alcohol addiction, unless it's being used as a harm reduction tactic. One of the things that's amazing about marijuana now is that we work a harm reduction approach at, at the Canadian Mental Health Association. And if I get a client coming in who's, who's using heroin, crack cocaine and marijuana, and they're telling me, you know what, they still need the escape, but the, the drugs that they're using are eventually going to kill them, we really focus on marijuana being the drug that they're going to continue to use as a harm reduction tactic because, as I said earlier, an overdose from, from marijuana uh, is very, very different to an overdose from an opiate um, or crack cocaine. Um, the use of marijuana in, inhibits interaction in activities at work, school or home. What I mean by that is uh, a lot of the time when people get involved in it with, as youth, um, it becomes People end up with a, a lack of motivation, they're not storing memories the way that they would normally, and it can really become a problem in the, the social environment of the, of the home. So finding your help for marijuana use, treatment is available. As I said, we, uh, we, we perform uh, counselling at the Canadian Mental Health Association. Um, treatment includes residential and community-based programmes, and more and more residential programmes now are looking at people that are, that are going in for primary marijuana use. Um, in the past, you know, maybe 10 years ago, marijuana use was looked as being, as being, you know, kind of insignificant and not something that you would go to residential treatment for. But because of the elevated levels of THC and the impact that that's having on people, it's now becoming a, a drug that's taken more seriously when it comes to a residential uh, form of treatment. In the community where a lot of the counselling that we do uh, is focused towards people with, with marijuana addiction, um, and we work very hard through things like CBT and dialectical behaviour therapy to try to help people through the, the process of getting over their addiction to the substance. Um, and one of the biggest things that's important is family support and education. Uh, a lot of, we get a lot of families coming into the Canadian Mental Health Association asking for information about mental health and marijuana. Uh, we, do, we take a lot of time to try to educate people as much as we can. In the program that I work in, we also have a family component, so we can end up counselling the individual that's using the substance along with helping the family as well with the, the things that they're going through. Because quite often we come across families that are what we, what we call codependent, um, and it can be a, a really tricky situation for people to try to recover in as well. So I went through that really, really quickly. Um, basically because when I looked on the, on the, uh, on the list there, I'd only got 15 minutes. So um, normally that presentation is about an hour long when I interact with the, with the audience a lot more, but I just want to throw it open. If there are any questions, I'm more than willing to answer. Uh, just to let you know, uh, 
I work in William Moser Health System. I'm an emergency physician, so if you come into the emergency department, uh, you may see me. I work at all three sites, Etobicoke, Brampton, and our brand new Peel Memorial Hospital. And uh, I also do everything else that uh, my friend here uh, talked about. Uh, so I just want to give a sh brief overview of uh, you know where you can get guidance and help and counseling and even services when it's acutely needed. And it looks like most of the audience here is from the Muslim and Pakistani community and we have uh, some of our other friends from the community as well. And what I need you to know is that being a Pakistani, uh, I came here when I was nine years old, and, and being Muslim, uh, we don't have a wall that stops drugs from coming into our community. Uh, we all suffer from it. So you need to keep an eye out for these things within your family, within your friends, within your children, and uh, within your youth. Uh, drugs don't go by culture and uh, we can all be impacted by it. In the emergency department, uh, I often deal with the acute problems. Uh, unfortunately, we see alcoholics all the time uh, in our department. Uh, they often come in alone. They're often found unconscious in a park or in a mall or in a bathroom. Uh, and when they come, uh, usually when we call their families, their families just say, we've been trying for years, we don't want to deal with this. Click. Uh, and that's something that I, I, do, I, I really want to convey that we cannot do. Because once you take an addict and you isolate them and you put them on their, out on their own and kick them out of the house, their addiction will usually get worse and they'll usually get into a more dangerous situation. You need to help them find and seek uh, treatment and, and, and give them support. Unfortunately, we're seeing a lot more of narcotic and opiate use and uh, opiate withdrawal in, uh, in our emergency departments. Uh, so that's where we deal with the acute problem, which is the immediate problem. At William Morrison Health System, we do offer services for addiction counseling, uh, for mental illness, and you know, my colleague Dr. Razi Said, he is here and he'll talk more about it. Uh, but we have a very broad spectrum of services. Uh, just for uh, mental illness, uh, we have significant resources at Chobuka General and at Brampton Civic. What we're really proud of is that at our new Peel Memorial Center for Health and Wellness, which has now been open for 13 months, we have child and adolescent services. Uh, and those range from any types of mental illness, such as depression, schizophrenia, ADHD, uh, behavior disorders, to addiction services. Now we don't only offer addiction services and counseling for the children or, 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 for, or for the teenagers. We will also provide services or provide you resources for the family members and the, for the parents uh, who need to work with their children. One of the other new things that we've started is what we're calling the transitional age or the transitional youth clinic. And that is for children or young adults between the ages of 18 and 24. And one thing we found in our community was that we had a lot of resources for the older population of uh, alcoholics, schizophrenics, and depressed people. And we had resources for the youth, but there was an in-between age group, that what we call the transitional youth, or, or the transitional adult, where we didn't have, where we had a lot, lack of services. And now we started that uh, at Peel Memorial as well. The last thing I want to talk about is our chemical withdrawal center. Uh, our chemical withdrawal center is actually on McLaughlin. It's a William Osler operated center. And uh, the chemical withdrawal center is for anyone that is addicted to either alcohol, drugs, or even an addiction to gambling. Uh, you're able to walk in either on your own or through a physician referral. And uh, we will help you with the acute phase and then I'll also help you find the resources uh, to help you get out of uh, that addiction. The chemical withdrawal center does not require a physician referral. You can walk in with your family or a loved one and get help. Uh, if you don't have a physician referral and you need some help, you can come to our emergency department and we will ha help you see one of our crisis workers. Uh, if you need to see a psychiatrist, we'll help you see a psychiatrist. If you need some immediate treatment, we'll treat it and then we'll help you set up some follow-up appointments. 
if you have family doctors and you have a family member or a loved one or yourself with some addiction issues, you can ask your family doctor uh, to refer you uh, to, to, to one of our sites. Uh, lastly, uh, what I want you to what, what I want to get across to you is that if you have any issues and you don't know what to do, please come to our hospitals. Uh, if you can't deal with anything at home, dial 911, call the ambulance, get them to bring your loved ones or yourself to the hospital. We will be there to help you. Uh, I just want to dispel some myths. I know there's some facts and fictions up there about drugs, but I want to dispel some myths about the really Moser Health System. And, uh, the first thing is, we have a hospital, the Chukovka General Hospital, that has the shortest wait time for emergency medicine in the province. I know you always talk about how long I spend in the emergency department. And Brampton Civic Hospital, the wait time to see a physician at Brampton Civic Hospital as of last month was one and a half hours. That was the average wait time. And there are times during the day that we have seven or eight physicians working all at the same time. So often the negative stories get into the paper uh, and the positive stories people don't talk about. And the reason they'll talk about, rightly so, is because you expect, you should expect to be seen in a timely manner and get quality care. That is not a new story, that is something that you should expect. So sometimes those things don't get out there. I'm here, I'm available, my office at William Moser Health System. Dr. Nabil Mohammed, if you need anything, uh, please come by my office or give me a call or we can talk about it after the event. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, very informative, uh, I think, session. I will first commend uh, the UIBC organization for uh, doing this awareness campaign, because this is something which is very much needed in our community. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dr. Razi Said. I work at William Oster uh, in adult geriatric and uh, psychosomatic medicine fields, which is uh, subspecialty fields. Uh, we also work in the emergency room, like Dr. Nabi Muhammad was uh, talking about, and see a lot of people from uh, uh, South Asian community showing up over there with different problems, generally uh, mostly alcohol, but also with uh, drugs. Uh, drugs meaning uh, opiates, marijuana, not so much, but uh, it's generally a combined substance with other things. Uh, make no mistake, uh, when you are using drugs, it's something which is going to affect your brain. Uh, when you start using it, maybe that much, not that much, but as you continue to use it, it uh, does have a significant health impact. And when I say health impact, I'm talking about uh, your uh, brain as well as your liver, heart, kidneys, most of the organs in the body. How that affects basically when you are in the growing age, because when you are talking from 12 to 20, 22, that's the growing age for the brain. That's where the pathways of the brain are maturing. That's where you are starting to have connections developing in the brain, which you are going to bank on in later part of your life for uh, academic and life successes. So if you are going to use drugs when you are in your teens, What's going to normally happen is that this uh, development of pathway, it doesn't sort of uh, progress as it's supposed to progress. Uh, there is something called pruning. Pruning means just like when you are like, uh, you have a garden and you go and you cut branches and you prune them and they grow in a certain way, the way you want them. The body has a natural mechanism of doing it in the brain also. So in your teenagers, there is a pruning going on. When you are born, you are born with billions of uh, brain cells and a lot of connections between these cells which uh, develop and which are strengthened as we grow older, especially in the teenage years. So some pathways are uh, uh, what you call, uh, there is a call, something called apoptosis, which means that the cells die in the brain and they die in a very systematized manner. Like the brain has a tendency to kill certain cells in the brain and uh, strengthen the other ones. So this is happening when you are going through your teenage years. So when you are using drugs, what you are doing is you are disrupting that whole pathway, your whole mechanism which is going to make you like, uh, I think one of my friends uh, when presenting the marijuana thing said that people when they use in teenage years, they have an IQ 38 less than what they would achieve in normal circumstances. That's exactly what's happening because when you are growing and you are using drugs in that period, you end up having 
less than the normal intelligence which you were supposed to have. Like if you come from a genetic composition where you were supposed to have an IQ of 120 or 130 or 150 or 200, you go and use drugs. Yeah, you may not be having a uh, like a major problem in life, but you obviously will not be having IQ of 200 which you were supposed to have. You basically end up becoming a normal person, which is most of us, including me maybe. But so that's what happens. So be careful when you are thinking about any of the drugs being uh, not sort of causing problems. Uh, when we are talking about drugs, one of the main uh, drugs which we see, people don't consider marijuana and alcohol as being very harmful drugs. Though so they are very, very sort of uh, uh, significant in terms of the damage they can cause to you. Uh, I think in the eMERGE we see all the time people coming in with uh, at later life, in the, in, in the later part of their life with liver failure, with uh, heart problems, people using cocaine, having heart attacks. Young people, I'm not talking about old people who have heart attacks, young people. Uh, so be careful. And when we are talking about the addiction rates, I think some of them have been touched here, but I will just give you a brief sort of uh, review of that. About 49 to 50 percent of the high schoolers end up having at least one binge in the last one month when survey was done in Ontario I'm talking about. Marijuana, about 25% of the kids are using it, uh, or at least have used it in the last month. Other drugs like opiates, like opiate meaning oxycontins, uh, percocets, uh, morphines, uh, cocaine, about 17%. High number, if you think about it. And in our community, we are not prone to that. I mean, we are not uh, immune from that. If we are sort of thinking that, okay, we are basically because of our, our cultural sort of uh, taboos or because of our religion, things will not be uh, that way. Don't be sort of uh, having this uh, false sense of uh, security. Not right. Another thing I would like to touch over here is that uh, uh, when we are basically moving through life, we, uh, I'm talking now to the parents, when you are dealing with your kids, you have to be careful about uh, about about like their behaviors, their sort of functioning. Communicate, keep an open channel with them, and uh, talk in a non-judgmental and free way. You will have a good sort of uh, interaction if you do that. Especially when you are talking about your uh, your youngsters, and they are saying to you that. Uh, they are going through a certain problem, you need to be more open, listen to them. Normally, I will uh, briefly sort of touch on what you normally see when people are using drugs. You will generally see them increase lying there, uh, stealing, uh, basically withdrawn behaviors, basically drop in grades, uh, irritability, anger outbursts, uh, closing off, meaning not talking to the family and parents, uh, losing their uh, old friends, developing new friends, all these are sort of like uh, uh, warning signs which you need to look at. Uh, I actually had, had a presentation too, but I think that was too, uh, too sort of uh, specialized for uh, uh, a general sort of uh, talk over here. So I will uh, stop here in terms of my, uh, my presentation and also touch on what we offer in terms of our hospital. Uh, William Mosler, as Dr. Mohammed had already touched, has a very extensive service of uh, uh, like counseling, uh, addiction services, especially geared towards the youth. Uh, we have day program, we have uh, inpatient program, and I would like to sort of very proudly say that we are the only hospital, Brampton Civic Hospital, only hospital in Etobicoke, Mississauga, and Brampton which has an inpatient unit for adolescents. None of the other hospitals have that. So if you look at the, uh, uh, the size of the program, uh, William Osler is, uh, I think, that's the biggest program in the whole area. Actually, our ER is the second biggest ER in terms of uh, the psychiatry and other services. I'm not sure if medical services is the same thing, but psychiatry, I know, in terms of the number after KMH. Uh, 
and it is growing. So we are trying to provide the best of the services in the limited resources we have and we are trying to do the best job and if you, any of you have any uh, problems I will suggest and I will encourage you to come to either our hospital or uh, maybe uh, come to one of the addiction centers or uh, Peel site which has a, I think, I don't think Dr. Naveen talked about it, but Peel site has much less uh, wait time than even other, our other two sites, including the William Oster Brampton site and the Tobago site. So, uh, I will end my conversation. Maybe we can take questions afterwards for that. Thank you very much. This great organization again. Um, when last I was here, um, I brought the room down by talking about gender based violence and sexual assault. That in the family context. And I'm going to bring the room down by talking about gender based violence and sexual assault again. Um, specifically, the use of so called party drugs, ecstasy, GHB, Molly, and things like that, and their impact on, unfortunately, date rape and other sexual violence issues. Um, Initially, though, to keep things a little bit lighter, I'd like to talk, um, as I was asked to, around the current bill before the Parliament of Canada to decriminalize and indeed to a significant extent make legal the recreational use of cannabis products, um, at least initially. Good evening. Assalamu alaikum. Namaste. Sashriya I want to congratulate Unity in the community because they bring common issues. Last time when I was here, they were collecting winter coats for the community. Congratulations. And one more congratulations. I see so many ladies. Let's put hands together. And big thanks to my brother. One thing more, you brought William Oster team. Now we have Dr. Naveed here. He's always working hard on the floor. On witnesses. And today, um, I really want to talk about our understanding of mental health. We heard hundreds of witnesses why we are legalizing marijuana. We don't want our kids to use marijuana. Our government wants to restrict and Take the hands, like we want our kids safe. That's why we are doing it. Right now, if you can see, WHO's report is there. Our teens are taking marijuana. Highest user in the world right now. Before even legalizing it, it was happening. It's a WHO report, I'm not making up. And we heard hundreds of witnesses in the health committee and that's why we are making, we are legalizing, we are restricting, we don't want our kids to use marijuana. And thank you for the initiative for this committee, uh, unity of the committee. Because we need awareness, this is, we, we are taking very seriously this issue. That's why we, in the health committee, all the members, we said we need awareness. For education, our government announced $18 million for the education, for the awareness, so our kids cannot use the drugs. Right now, it's easy to access marijuana than alcohol. We don't want that. So that's why we don't want gangs are getting strong. We want our kids' future. So anytime, if you have any question, you can talk to me. And one thing I just want to tell you, we came here, I'm an immigrant woman, and you are an immigrant. You don't want your kids to see in the drugs. We want our kids to be seen as a successful businessman, doctors, engineers, politicians. So that's why be friends with kids. I know back home our kids are very strict. A few days ago I did a harassment training and if, I, if my father see that, it's like an abusive authority, I can see that. So be friends with your kids. Ask them how was the day today, especially for the mothers. Mothers can be play a big role in that. Again, thank you for having me here today. And thank you, Unity in the Community. Bring more issues like diabetes here and bring all of William Osler team here. On the status of women, 
and the Standing, on, Standing Committee on Procedures and House Affairs. Please welcome Ruby Sahota. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me out today. Unity in the community, congratulations on another successful event, Full Room. Uh, this is a great initiative. It's a, definitely something that our community, the South Asian community, I mean, has been discussing for some time now. Uh, youth is prominent in all communities, and especially ours. So I know that uh, seeing this room here in full today makes me realize that people are taking it seriously and they recognize that this is not um, not an issue that doesn't affect our community. Maybe it's just, you know, gore, the white people, they're doing drugs and it's not happening in our, door, in our homes. But it definitely is. But the first step is recognizing the issue, seeing if your children are abusing drugs, seeing what the signs are and our healthcare professionals are here uh, that have so wonderfully alerted us to some of those signs, things, precautions, how to talk about it with your children. It's a reality. And not discussing it doesn't change that reality. It doesn't solve the problem. Uh, there's been some talk about legalizing marijuana. I am a federal representative, so it's discuss something that we've been discuss discussing quite a bit. Um, and I have an open invitation to all of you as well. If you do want to talk about your concerns with me, please come talk about them. But currently what the facts are is that our kids are using marijuana. And the legalization that is happening we're not legalizing it for kids anyways. It's not legalized for the youth. There's age limits that are put on this, just like alcohol or anything else that uh, restricted substances. We make sure that this is being regulated. New laws, criminal laws are going to be put into effect to make sure that there's harsher penalties to those that try to sell to young people, to the youth. So harsher penalties than we've ever had before for sales, or trafficking to young people. Right now, this is a currently a major problem. About 21% of our youth currently admit to using marijuana, and 30% of our young adults, and just like Sonia has pointed out, we're one of the highest users in, the developed, in developed countries. So what's the problem? There's obviously a problem right now before anything even takes effect this summer, and uh, I know that there's some maybe um, skepticism that it might be passed or not, but uh, things are actually looking good in that regard. And uh, I think you will be seeing it legalized this summer, so it's not something that we're hiding from. It is something that we're, it's a step that we're taking and I want to engage with you on it. I don't want to hide about it and we want to figure out how we can successfully continue with this legislation moving forward this summer and how we can still protect our kids. And not just our kids, right? But our adults. Because our kids right now are vulnerable as it is. If you ask a kid, and I think we should have these honest conversations with our kids at home, ask your kids. Ask your kids if it's easy to get marijuana at home. Uh, if they're in their schools, sorry. Hopefully not in their homes, but in their schools. Because I didn't realize when I was younger that it was so easy. Because I wasn't really in that scene, I wasn't involved. But when you ask people that are in that scene or are aware, and even now, when I ask people on my youth council that I have, they, they chuckle and they laugh because they think it's not, even, it's not even something that's a concern for them because if they wanted to do marijuana, they would be doing marijuana today. So I think it's really important for us to educate ourselves, to make these, talk about these issues at our dining table with our children what drugs are out there, what the side effects can be, what the repercussions are. Not from a legal standpoint, of course, and we have lawyers that can help us with that. Legally, what the repercussions are, but mentally, physically, and health-wise, what the repercussions are. Legally, there are repercussions to most drugs, and will continue to be repercussions for those that are selling drugs to our minors. Um, so, I'm really proud, I'm really happy, because I grew up in a an Indian household and we didn't talk about these things and and now I talk to the, my parents now that I'm an older person I talk to my parents about these things and as they see the news you know as they see the fights happening in the you know schoolyards and all the stuff that we're seeing on the news today in the South Asian community fights gun violence drug use 
They're saying, oh my God, what's happening to our community? Why is this happening all of a sudden? You know, what's going wrong? Where are we taking a wrong turn? And I just want to say it's not happening all of a sudden. It's really not. I was in high school in the 90s here. It was happening then as well. Some things are getting highlighted a little bit more now because of social media, uh, because our community has grown. But I had seen a lot of vicious fights in the schoolyard when I was in high school here. Whether it was with weapons or not, that was the first time I had seen a gun. I heard of a lot of people being exposed to drugs. So it's a problem that we need to figure out what the cause is and not figure out scapegoats, figure out, you know, what is happening, what's been happening, maybe our children have been hiding it from us. Because I wasn't telling my parents anything about what was happening at school when I came home, right? And your kids aren't either. So we need to figure out how to open that dialogue up and talk to our kids, get them the right help and support. Mental health is another issue, I think, in our community, in every community, that people shy away from. They don't talk about it because it's, there's a stigma attached. No one wants to tell their friends, you know, my kid may be depressed or is having mental issues or my kids are using drugs. And if we're not talking about this with our friends, what good are our friends? What are they there for? Your friend can maybe point you in the right direction, tell you where there's help at William Osler or other organizations where you can go. We need to open up, we need to talk to our friends about these things because you know what? You'll be surprised to learn that your friend will probably say, you know what, my kid went through a similar issue. And this is the info I have. And this is what I can share. So I think we should stop being ashamed and hiding in our homes and dealing with these problems, probably not in the most best way because we're making our kids more susceptible, we're causing them more harm than good by doing that. So that's all I have to say, um, and I'm not trying to hide either from this issue, so please contact me. Sound system, please contact me, feel free. My office is near William Osler. Um, it's at 50 Sunny Meadow Boulevard, so anyone that lives in Branton North, let's talk about it. And if your kids are going through these types of issues, or you know, other people, adults in your household, whether it is domestic violence or drugs or whatever, mental health. Let's talk about these issues and we can point you in directions where you may be able to receive the help that you need. Thank you. So there was, this was the information given in this seminar that was organized by Unity in the community and I hope you got the information regarding drug, how it's abusing and how it kills the brains of you. And uh, the emphasis on this seminar was just be friendly with your children, be uh, close to them and uh, ask them what, uh, what they are doing and, uh, and as everybody, Dr. Navid said, uh, that uh, it's, uh, if, if somebody is involved in addiction, please don't uh, lose hope. Just bring to the addiction center and you don't even need the referral of the physician. As uh, uh, Dr. Raza Said said, the look at the warning signs, uh, what changes are happening in your child. Just be careful about how they are uh, behaving. And as all the MPs have said about the uh, regularization of marijuana, how the government is also thinking of uh, it, uh, illegal use. So that's why they make the legalized so that it, uh, it can be away from the youth. And uh, please be careful about your children, how they are behaving. This is the main uh, emphasis of this seminar, that be friendly to the youth and be close to them. So thank you for watching Health is Welcome and Digital. And uh, goodbye and see you next time.